stand, please, for the reading of God's word. The point of that drama was to highlight the power that raised Jesus from the dead, that is still available to change our lives and minister to us today. <clears throat> Pastor Cliff, would you please pray for the preaching of the word? Thank you, Cliff. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 10 is our text. The power of the resurrection is the title of today's service and this message. The Apostle Paul is writing from a prison. He's in chains. But what things were gained to me, I have counted these things to be lost for the sake of Christ. Yes, certainly I count everything as lost, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have forfeited the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God on the basis of faith. And this is the key verse, to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed in his death. You may be seated. <clears throat> what Paul says is that what he wants most is to know Jesus. That word is genosko, and it means to know experientially. Not just to know him in concept, not to have seen him and believe he is, but to know him. How well do you know him? Do you know him by name? Or do you know his voice? Do you know his presence? When Penny comes up beside me, I know it's her. When she comes to bed with me, I know it's her. When she whispers in my ear, I know it's her. <laughs> do you know Jesus that way? Or don't you know him that way? Paul said that everything that I was, everything that I've had, is not as important and I count it as loss to knowing Jesus. That knowing Jesus, to me, is more important than everything and anything else I could lose. And he ended up losing his life. The first way we know Jesus is by salvation. But what's that mean? There are two ways that Paul mentions in verse 10 that I think we get to know Jesus more intimately. And let's discuss those. The first, he said, I want to know him, and I want to know him through the power of his resurrection. Most people, theologians and experts, people smarter than I, would say, well, that means we get born again, and so we know him by salvation. And I would agree with that, but I believe that it goes deeper. Knowing Jesus through the power of his resurrection begins... When we come to that place where we acknowledge that I cannot be good enough to get into heaven. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of the Lord and the wages of sin is death. And so all of us are born separate from God. We cannot ever be good enough to get to God. And that's why Jesus came and died on the cross. So the power of His resurrection begins Actually, before we call in His name as His Spirit, as the Father, the Bible says that the Father draws us. If you've never called on the name of Jesus believing, is God trying to draw you? And this isn't just for our guests, because I've seen people who have been in church for years who finally the light switch goes on and they get it. This is for all of us sitting here. My testimony. There was a time in my life when I believed I was a Christian, but I didn't know him personally. And when I became hopeless and desperate because you could die at any moment, three people I know died in two, two weeks, I said, what's the point of living if you can die at any mo moment? And then I went to my sister's graduation from TC3, 
And I met a couple there who knew Jesus as they knew him personally. And they shared with me about a personal relationship that they had with him and the joy they had I wanted. And so I asked him into my life on the way home from their house that one night that summer. And my life has not been the same since. It hasn't always been easy, but I've never been in despair and hopeless again. The Lord drew me and he draws any of us to receive Christ. The power of the resurrection is what happens when we call on the name of Jesus, believing, you know what, I'm not good enough to get to heaven, and I need Jesus, and I believe he was raised from the dead, I believe he died for me, and I need him. I know that I need him, and I want him in my life. You don't become a member of a church. You call out to Jesus. You say, please, help me, save me. I will make you Lord of my life. Romans 10.9 says that we have to make him Lord of our lives and believe in our heart God raised him from the dead. And in that moment, the power that raised Jesus from the dead, the same power that came and took his body, which was so mutilated, he looked, it was hard to distinguish him as a man, the Bible says. It came upon him and raised him to life. And that same power came to me and comes to us when we call upon his name and believe. That power comes and lives inside us. I fear for us, and I fear for Christians around the world because so many say they're Christians, and so many say they believe in Christ, and yet there's something missing. I have, he, the Lord has been teaching me just recently about how He works in a person before they call on the name of Jesus and they believe. But folks, we aren't saved when we say a prayer and call in the name of Jesus and believe. And say, I believe in the Lord. We're not born again at that moment. I've seen too many people who call in the name of the Lord and say a prayer and even have tears and then walk out the door and don't care. But I have seen people who would pray, nothing would happen. Who would pray, nothing would happen. Who would pray one day, and whatever needed to take place, God had been working in their hearts, and in that moment, in that moment, the power that raised Jesus from the dead came to live inside them through the Holy Spirit. That's when we become born again, because that's when we know that He's come to live inside us. It's not just a hopeful moment or a joy. There is a presence. He doesn't take us over, but He comes to live inside us, and we know He's real, regardless of everything else. But it doesn't mean that we become perfect or, or all of our lives are changed in that instant. It means that He comes to live inside us and He continues to work inside us. And I would challenge you, if you have not had that experience when you've called on the name of Jesus Christ, when you know that He came to live inside you and you know it and He's been working in you and He shows you things that need to change and there's a surrender that takes place. Over time, as he works with you, but he's real, if you've not experienced that, I would exhort you and plead with you, please, today is the day of salvation. Don't ever quit asking for Christ to come live inside you until you receive that. Thank you, Clifford. Keep asking until you receive. And so today could be that day. I don't care how many times you prayed. Jesus is the one who does the work in our hearts. The power of the resurrection. The Holy Spirit raised him from the dead and he was given life. His body was given life and he was exalted. He was exalted above all names at that time. But the people who knew him, they were drawn to him. They said, this truly is the Son of God. You saw the centurion. Truly, this is the Son of God. The people who were fearful on Friday when he was crucified and Saturday when he was dead, Sunday morning, found him to be alive. And it meant that there's a God in heaven who is real, who loves us. There is someone who will save us. Jesus Christ our Lord, who is real. And when, after Pentecost, when the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, they came across that crippled beggar who said, you know, I want money. And Peter said, I have neither gold nor silver, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up. 
And when that beggar stood up, it was the power that raised Jesus from the dead that came upon him through the Holy Spirit and brought life to his body, healing to his body. And in that moment, he knew not only physical healing, but he knew Jesus was alive. And he knew Jesus intimately. He knew he was real. And the people around, they saw, because Peter gave testimony by faith in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 3, verse 16. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him as you can all see. And so other people believe because of that. How many people here, who here has experienced a physical healing when you've been prayed for in Jesus' name? Would you stand? Would you stand? You may not have been healed the first time. You may not have been healed the second time. Anybody take more than one time of prayer to get healed? Amen. That would, I would encourage you, if you need healing today, when I get done, we're going to have that leaders of the church come here and prepare to pray. Will you ask and see what God will do? Is this worth giving testimony? This is the power of God. Would you give Dad a, God, yeah, our Father a clap off him. Amen. You can be seated. So we come to know Christ as He heals us because it is, it is the power of the Holy Spirit. It's part of God that comes. It is God who comes to live inside us. He touches our bodies. And in that moment, we get to know Him more intimately. But there's an even deeper way. Paul said, I want to know Him through the power of His resurrection, but also I want to know Him through the fellowship of His suffering. That word fellowship is the word koinonia. It's what we talk about in Christian circles. It's a having in common. We can't have real fellowship. A believer, a Christian, or true born-again Christian, Christian cannot have fellowship with someone who's not born again as well. Because it is Christ that we have in common. And because we have Christ in common, we trust one another. Not immediately, but we grow to trust one another and God lowers the walls so that we really do know one another. Amen? Amen. The having in common with Jesus is the suffering. And again, theologians say, well, as we suffer for Christ, we are joining Him in His sufferings. But I would say to you that it's deeper and more intimate than that. When we suffer for Jesus like some people are doing around the world today. But even for those of us who don't suffer under persecution, but we suffer in other ways that are pretty terrible, it is a doorway to intimacy with Jesus. How many here have known someone who has gone through great trials, great pain, great suffering, and as they went through it, their spirit got sweeter, and it seemed as though they knew Jesus more deeply all the time. How many of us? See, that is because our Father in Heaven, our Savior Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, God Almighty is not cold to us. When Jesus in John chapter 11 came, Lazarus was buried in the tomb, and the sisters, Mary and Martha, came out one at a time, it said that he was grieved in his spirit. When he saw everyone crying, it says that he wept. Whatever you're facing today, Jesus cares and he has compassion for you. If you will draw near to him, he will draw near to you. But your heart has to be open to it. If you love him and you cry out to him, he will draw near to you. As He does draw near to you, and you know He's there, it deepens your love for Him. When my dad died in 2009, I do, would not want to go through that pain again. The neighbor here knows what it was like. My wife knows what it was like. My children know what it was like. Staff knows what it was like. And yet, at the same time, Jesus drew near 
so intimately that I missed that. The suffering, the pain was so bad, and yet His presence was so real. And there have been times when I face things in this church, challenges of different sorts, and some of the board members know what some of those things were. He always comes near me. And I'm not the only one. How many of you know what I mean? When things get worse, He becomes sweeter. He is real. But folks, the challenge is in our heart. Because some of you have suffered, and you say, well, God hasn't come and touched me that way. Well, I would ask you, were you born again first? Have you asked Him into your heart and letting the walls down and really believe and known that He came and lived inside you? If you knew that He came to live inside you, and it's been a, it's been a process of surrender, because that's what it is. If you've experienced that, then the next question I would ask you is this. Have you hardened your heart toward Him? Because if we get embittered toward Him, it makes calluses. It puts walls up between us and God. It makes it more difficult for us to sense His presence. In addition to coming forward for prayer, for healing, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, or for breakthroughs or challenges, if you are suffering today, I would encourage you to come up, whatever the suffering is, and ask someone to pray with you. And then linger at the altar. Find a place to worship, because there's a healthy worship set after this altar call. And cry out to God. And from this day forward, cry out to God, and He will make Himself real to you. Pastor Joe, if you'd come up. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Says this, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone merry? Let him sing psalms. See the rest of us. If you're not suffering and you don't need prayer for anything, praise God. And lift up His name and worship Him because He becomes present. We were just studying in our life group this morning. He inhabits the praises of His people. He is enthroned in them. And it pushes back the forces of darkness. And you experience more joy. Is any one of you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. I want to challenge you. Don't know you? Not really. Some of you are friends. Some of you are acquaintances. Some of you I haven't met. But regardless of how well I know you, have you had that experience where Jesus came to live inside you? Let's settle that one first before we have time for prayer. Is Jesus drawing you near? Is there something stirring inside you? You want to believe? It's difficult to believe. Maybe you've had disappointments. He's real. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes for just a second? If you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, do you understand that the Bible says no one is good enough to enter heaven? No, not one. And most of us know our shortcomings. But are you willing to choose to believe that He died on the cross for you? Are you willing to choose to believe that He was raised from the dead and lives? And if you're willing to choose to believe that, will you today call on His name and seek Him for salvation, for Him to come live inside you and you would have your very best friend who would never leave you nor forsake you. But you begin a relationship that you have to pursue. 
Is there anyone here who's never done that who'd like to do that today? If that's you, would you please raise your hand high for me? Second question. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. If you've called upon the name of Jesus, have you had that inner witness that you're a child of God? Have you known that he's come to live inside you? If you have not, would you stand in your seat and say, I want him, and I want all of him? That asks for boldness. Is there anyone here who would say, Jesus, I am desperate for you and I want to know. I want to have you come and live inside. Would you just stand where you are? See if Jesus will meet you. Then let's all stand. If our board members